What's up, people? Welcome to another edition of the New Breed Podcast, the world's best new metal podcast from two guys who are really there. Actually, three guys. I'm hey. one half, one half <laughs> of the of the one triplet tonight, one third. Jay Horsecow with me. I have my partner in crime, the notorious TIM. Tim, are you sick of the air conditioning yet? Yes, I am. Yes. Let's open the damn windows. And joining I can't us wait. Uh, once again, the the mastermind behind Karen Ear and Memorage and a million <laughs> um, music projects, uh, our our irregular regular Gary. Gary, thanks for joining. Hey, thank thank you for having me. Thank you guys. Uh, it's going to be a blast, you know, to be here again to be talking about uh, Iowa. Yeah, yeah, oh, we yeah, are man. stoked to have you, Gary. So oh, as, yeah. if, as if our listeners and watchers didn't know, uh, the topic of tonight, we're going to do a deep dive. And we're going to do a deep dive that surprisingly, three, four, five years, how many years Tim and I have been doing this in this podcast, an album we have never went into, and it is Slipknot's Iowa. Mm-hmm. When So before we go in, Tim, before you give us some of the background on the album itself, mm-hmm. when was the last time you guys actually listened to this album front to back before we scheduled the show? Mm-hmm. I can't remember. Been a long time. Um, it was a couple months ago. It was. Uh yeah, I think like front front to back. No, no pause, no skip, no not that no going to another album. Uh it was a couple months ago, but before that, um, maybe a year ago. So it's been scattered. Uh and and then you before that, honestly, five plus years. So scattered for sure. Yeah. Same, same. Um, and when we get into it, when we go to some of the songs, I'll I'll talk about some of my memories and why. I never very, I very rarely listen to this album front to back. I turn it on, I pick up one or two songs I want to listen to, and then it, sure, on to the yeah. next thing. Yeah, but that's also today's ADHD type children. So Tim, I give agree. us some, give us some background here. <laughs> All right, released August twenty eighth, two thousand one, through Roadrunner Records, produced by the band and Ross Robinson at Sound City and Sound Image Studios in L.A. So obviously, their second record after their genre defining self titled. Because let's be honest, that's a genre genre defining record. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I got some quotes here and stuff too, which are pretty good. So the band describes this record as the darkest time as a band because of management issues, pressure to write the record, drug use within the band, the band itself having problems within with each other. <laughs> and also Joey described it as the band at war because their content schedules of playing live and writing music. And also because apparently Joey and Paul wrote this record. So they, after the touring, they like nonstop were just in the studio doing it. Mm. And like, I guess the rest of the band was just like fucking off doing drugs and all that shit. Yeah. Which makes sense yeah. because <laughs> it's a I band mean, of nine dudes. There's yeah. not enough work to keep nine dudes busy. Right. <laughs> well, the popularity something. of that mm. record with, you know, the getting, I mean, they went from playing basements to fucking, you know, headlining I arenas. Guess. Yeah, yeah headlining a world crazy, dude. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I can't imagine, right? So, that, like you said, Tim, they toured relentlessly from what was it, 90? Was it 98? When did the self title come out? 98? 99. 99. Was it 99? Yeah. Was it self title? Yes, yes, you're right. Um, And they just they hit Ozfest, right? You, ever, yeah. you guys ever watched that first? There's a, there's a, it's on YouTube with somebody yeah. camcorder their yes. first Ozfest. Set. Amazing footage. Yeah. Right, yeah. Gary? Like, can you yeah. imagine being in the audience and being like, yo, what's this band about? And these dudes come out <laughs> fucking hitting kegs, like in right. jumpsuits. Like, yo, what am I seeing? But chaos. Th- they literally <laughs> took the hate breed approach of you tore the fuck out of the album and so you can't tour it anymore. And they opened for everybody. They toured with everybody and they stayed on the road. And, yeah. you know, all these bands talk about how it's a party. Right. It's because now they're they're doing shows, they're traveling, they're having fun, they're doing drugs, they're drinking, whatever. They did that nonstop for years. And then they went right into the studio. Like I crazy. I can't I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. Especially got, back I, then. Yeah. I got another quote here. So Sean, how do you say his last name? Crayon? Crayon. Crayon? Yeah. Crayon? He yeah. described the studio sessions as hell. And this is <laughs> him quote it. I wanted to kill myself. There was bitches, drugs, rock and roll, and all that shit. He also said people just expected so much of them back then, and that people equal shit is about that. It's their way of saying fuck off and leave us alone. So, so th- apparently, they were just so like, what's the word? In inundated? And what's that word? Inundated. Today? Yeah, inundated. They mm-hmm. were so like inundated with like people just you know wanting to like be friends with them and hang with mm-hmm. them and all that shit, and it's just yeah. like. Yeah, I get. I guess I could see it because I would never want to be a celebrity ever. 
the... no i'd want to be rich i wouldn't want to be famous no yeah, yeah no. exactly <laughs> right but, but to your point tim like think about it right um if you look at the album when we dig into the songs right they have they they blew up out of nowhere that them and nickelback are the two bands that roadrunner hung their hat on right yeah. they, they kind of said fuck you to glass draw which is another tragedy tra- travis travis mockery for another yeah. day but they basically hung their label on these two bands that's true and they did nothing but hammer and hammer and hammer. And then they went back into the studio and you know what? They turned out something that cause they were so pissed <laughs> off. And when you, when we go into the songs, I think it was purposefully abrasive, discordant, almost difficult to listen to because mm-hmm. they were just like, well, fuck everybody. Like, whoa, no, no. And yeah. like, well, yeah. when we go through the songs, right? Like there's some, it's fucking sledgehammer to face, sledgehammer to face, sledgehammer to face, nonstop. I, yeah. I could just see it as like, not a juvenile, but just almost an over emotional lashing out of all these people just like sitting over your shoulder, right? Yeah. People yeah, equal I, shit for real. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I got I got a couple more here for you. Mm-hmm. So Corey also stated that they went from a small band to these huge rock stars in a very quick matter, and that they weren't ready for it and didn't plan on it. So they got caught up in everything that comes with it, and it quickly escalated. So mm-hmm. the drug use, the party, and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Because, like we were just saying, it's like it's like Gary putting out his record, and then just it gets forty million views in a <laughs> you know in a day, we'll right. say, mm-hmm. and then he walks out of his house, and everyone's like, "Holy fuck, Shit. you're signed!" You know what I mean? Like that's right. yep. that's got to be a shock to the system, dude. I agree. That would be, yeah, yeah. It's you know like, I mean? a, like a one eighty, like you, the no, no person could handle that uh, in a safe you know same matter emotionally balanced yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. i mean you'd have to tip over right and and with that i mean we all have jobs and we know what the feeling of the pressure cooker at work is Mm -hmm. but can you imagine that like when you're not only in the pressure cooker but you're famous like you can't even go get a fucking dunkin donuts without eight (laughs) thousand people mobbing you saying yo you're the guitarist from slipknot number four i love you but like right I, i can't I can't even imagine. And I mean, let's give them credit though. Here we are talking about the negative part. This is an amazingly well-written album Mm -hmm. and they knocked out some monster, monster songs. And with that stress, they turned and they pushed it inwards and it was just fucking, it's insanity, right? Like I, I, did you see, did either of you guys see them tour off this album, Tim? No, I wish. I wish I did. What, what did you see? What show? I for well, first I seen the ninety nine tour for the record release, and then they played again for Iowa with uh who the fuck was that tour Jay? Uh, were you there at the Spectrum? No, 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 no. They played they played another round of not arenas. They played another round of like Electric Factory dates after uh, that. I didn't I didn't see the I the only time I saw them headline was I saw them at the Birch Hill. Okay, but they opened. I saw them open for what was it? The cold. It was the Leaving La Vida Loco tour with Cold Chamber and Machine Head. But oh, they, okay, okay. this album comes out at the same time. This album comes out. People don't remember. Toxicity comes out at the same time. Yeah. So you had System of a Down and Slipknot headlining the Pledge of Allegiance with American right. Head Charge with Rammstein with a whole bunch no of other bands. Yeah, and it was like, I, and that's where I saw them. It was on the floor of the Spectrum. What a shithole. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was. Jesus and it Christ. was, but it was. The floor was just, I, it was jam, jam packed. Funnily enough, Slipknot was the headliner. Like, I know it was a co headliner, but Slipknot played second. The place kind of cleared out a bit after System of a Down. Oh, huh. it's not surprising at that. And time. that's that to me is where I said, yo, System of a Down is way bigger than anybody thinks they are. Right. Cause yeah. I mean, it didn't clear out, but it was like, uh, honestly, it was like, um, I, I, it was like, this is hardcore this year when I went on Sunday. After Gridiron, the place really got kind of empty. Damn. And it's like, okay, well, I guess that's who everybody was here for. Huh. Thinned out. Yeah. All right. One more here. Corey revealed that during the recording for vocals, he was completely naked, vomiting all over himself and cutting himself a broken glass. He explained that's where the best stuff comes from. You've got to break yourself down before you can build something great. While producing the album, Ross Robinson injured himself in a dirt bike accident accident and suffered a fractured back in the process he returned to studio after a day of hospital treatment reportedly putting all of his pain in the album much to the admiration of the band so everybody's just fucked up doing this man <laughs> I, I i can't 
I can't even imagine. And and you, there's those stories about how um Russ Robinson winged a potted plant at Joey Jordison. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And like he was throwing <laughs> shit at people, and I mean, not for nothing. This right. was Ross's way of getting getting, getting emotional better. performances yeah. out of people. And I mean, whether it's whether it's mentally healthy or not, there's no denying what he got out of the first two Horn albums, what he got mm. out of the first two Slip On albums, the Limp yeah. Biscuit album. Um, I, I mean, maybe that's honestly maybe that's what more bands need is a producer to push them into a place that they're not necessarily comfortable because maybe maybe right. that's I mean that's where true art comes from. You look at, look at, look at like some of the painters mm-hmm. in in human history who have just, uh, this fucking cat, if he keeps calling on shit, I'm going to lose my mind. Um, <laughs> you look at some of the famous painters who were not, not all there. Right. right. A- and there's something to be said for artistry, but yeah, this, let's get into it. Cause this album, man, yeah, I got some yeah. good fucking notes here. Hell yeah. One, one, one more thing, my bad. All good. So the band, there was an interview I seen, and the band was saying, like, this is the record that they basically wanted to make and not to self-title. Like, they wanted to put this mm. record out first. But Interesting. They were saying that the when, because because I didn't know this either. I didn't know that Jim Root didn't play on the first Mm-mm. record. Right. I, I only knew that, like, just like four or five years. Like, not that, yeah. I didn't yeah, know that apparent, back then. Yeah, apparently he only wrote, like, one, a couple of riffs on the entire record. So mm-hmm. when he comes in on the writing sessions of this, that's where it got like really just pummeling. Like Jay was saying, like the sledgehammer effect. Mm -hmm. So apparently if he was in the band, when the first record came out, it probably would have sounded more of Iowa. So Mm -hmm. we might not even have gotten that record. If you think about it, that's crazy. Uh, It's kind of like, um, I mean, you can compare it to Tim. We've talked about this before the whole breed, the killer slither with earth crisis where slither was the slither was the album that roadrunner wanted. But instead, Earth Crisis gave them Breed the Killers. Yeah. Right? Or or, or mm-hmm. um, what was the other example where, um was it Fear Factory? Digimortal, where oh, Roadrunner yeah. said that we want a new metal record. And Dino basically mm-hmm. went, well, eat a dick. I'll write a new metal record <laughs> in my sleep. Yep. And there's where they landed. Yeah. God and damn. before huh? we get into it, <laughs> uh, it's considered the band's darkest and heaviest record, which is obvious. It mm-hmm. sold incredibly well. It's gone platinum in the U.S., Canada, and U.K., So it sold amazingly well. So I'm assuming off this record and volume three, they pretty much made the bank right there and they never have to work again. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even between nine people. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Right. (laughs) Right. Imagine if there's five people in the band, they're even, it's even more ridiculous. I I still keep going back to the fucking first sound guy who's going Nine, <laughs> nine inputs. Oh, nine in, like real, like, it was fucking how, like how I, many I, wedges? I, how many wedges yeah, you guys need? Yeah, right. <laughs> you mean I have to put an SM57 on a keg? What? All right, hilarious. let's party. Oh, yeah, let's do it. So I know mm. 515 is just the area code where they're from. So that's the the, the first mm. song, which is this noise. So we can mm-hmm. get into the rest. Well, now. well, to that, though, Tim, and I don't want to I don't want to touch on volume three because eventually we're going to do a deep dive on that. But look at the intro to the self-titled. Look at the intro to Iowa. Right. Mm-hmm. Abrasive, foreboding. Right. Like really kind of uncomfortable. Uh, kind probably of one each of other. The- Yes, yes. Uh, probably one of the most uncomfortable intros I've heard, short of the, the newest Pale Face album, where mm. I, I, I couldn't even listen to that. I couldn't even listen to that. Um, but then you look at volume three, and it's like, <laughs> yo, you put you put slip, you put stone sour in my slipknot. Yeah. Knock it off. Yeah. Knock it yeah. off. And I think yeah. we all knew what was coming yep. on the back of that intro. Absolutely. So true. We'll, we're definitely getting into that when we get into the record. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right. So track number two, three minutes, 35 seconds. People equal shit. Dude, Tim, I, I'm start I remember I used to when I was in when I was graduating high school <laughs> or when I graduated high school, I was working at Kmart. I was a receiving associate. And I remember on break, I went and bought the record. They luckily had it. And that's back when we had this man. I go back to the receiving area to have my lunch, my little cooler there, and I put the CD in finally, get get my fresh batteries. And I remember people, people equal shit came on, and I was like, holy fuck. 
Cause that song, dude, back then when you're when you're fucking nine, 18, 19, and you hear that, dude, you're like, whoa, dude. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I always remember working at Kmart. I could I could remember what it looked like sitting there till this day, and that was what twenty years ago, twenty two years ago. Fuck, yeah, that is wild. That is absolutely yeah. wild. How about so, you, Gary? <laughs> okay, so I uh, I was I was a little bit younger. So I was at I was just starting high school. Uh, so yeah, two thousand one. Uh, so I was a freshman and, um, me and my friends, you know, we were big on Slipknot already off the back of self-titled and the anticipation of that summer, like leading into Iowa. Cause I think that they released the the music video for left behind that summer. I'm pretty sure if I remember right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And we were like, Oh, okay. This is like, this still has like a, a bit of this, some of the sing songy chorus, uh, nature on, on that song um but we were like man this is this is gonna be really good and you know we were we were hyped and the day the release day comes um i remember i think m- i had to give my friend some money to go grab it with his dad at like a cd warehouse um and then he showed up at school with two copies to give me one that i paid for like the the day before and so we we didn't have any classes together like that first uh whatever semester of high school mm-hmm. but we'd see each other like on our routes in the hallways and stuff and we both brought our 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 disc mans <laughs> to school you know uh headphones in in our hoodie pockets and stuff like that concealed um <laughs> and <laughs> and we would both like throughout the day anytime we'd see each other in between classes or whatever we were like dude dude because we 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 both knew we were listening to iowa like any chance we could get so so actually our first my first listen was kind of fragmented in that way and then i eventually listened to the whole thing like after school like on the bus ride home and then you know getting home but throughout the day like i kept replaying the intro and like people equal shit and i'm like dude this is another level so corrosive compared Mm -hmm. to self-titled yeah so uh that will always stick with me so i have an interesting story with this album so i pre-ordered this through sam goody i think it was Uh, this is and this is me guys making me feel old i am this is me (laughs) post-college post-college at this point um one year two years two years and i pre-ordered it game came with two free tickets to ozfest 2001 the last ozfest i went to and i didn't pick it up until the week of labor day because I was mm. I was away on vacation, and I remember sure. I, I went on a dude's vacation. We went and we went golfing, and we went go- we went drinking, and we went down to Tampa, and it was kind of wild. But I remember sitting in the airport and watching that video for Left Behind, and going, "Shit, like is this is this what it's gonna be like? You know, like is it all gonna be like this? Like ah, right?" And, and then I go home and I go to Sam Goody. I picked up this. I picked up Toxicity. I get home, and I'm like, "What the, f- what the fuck?" Like. I mean, uh, to, to, Tim, you had the quotes about how they were miserable, they were angry, they were they were pissed off that everybody had all these expectations. So they literally opened with the most hyper aggressive way to do that is to give the middle finger back to everybody. Um, I actually think it establishes it's almost like it's almost like a dog peeing on a tree trunk at this point. Mm-hmm. They're establishing <laughs> dominance to say yeah. we are going heavier than our last album, mm-hmm. and it's you know it's a monster. I mean, the chorus the chorus is is huge. I mean. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's God bless them, you know, God bless them for, for turning an expletive into a chorus <laughs> that the whole room will sing. Yeah. But I just, I, it's, it's, it's a hell of a crowd pleaser. And I mean, the, I mean, we, later in the album, the dynamics of how they play and how the instruments interact really start to come out. But man, this was, mm-hmm. this was a monster. And that fucking breakdown at two minutes and 20 seconds where it's like, oh, good. all Thank right, you, hit, hit somebody with a chair, like just hit somebody. Yeah. Well, th- this song put blast beats into the mainstream. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Open opening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whew. I mean, I yeah, the record pretty much puts blast beats in the mainstream. I think after I mean, obviously ba- blast beats are prevalent through death metal and stuff like that. Yeah. But now you think about it, like people heard that and they're like, shit, like we Whoa. can put blast beats on our music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they were the one who brought blast beats into the masses. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, one could argue, well, well what about Meshuggah? Meshuggah wasn't blasting. Meshuggah does something that's completely <laughs> right. So, yeah. so, so speaking of that timeout, Tim, have you heard the Vild Vilhirta? Yep, I heard it today. Yep. Gary, oh, have you no. checked out Vil? No. Oh, it's the guy from not. Humanity's Last Breath. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh, my we gotta get him on the show. I'll stay up late. 
I don't Ooh, care. Yeah. But mm-hmm. that just, <laughs> God, what a, I gotta check that. What a amazing. But anyway, um, yeah. So people equal shit is a monster way to open an album. It's a giant middle finger. It's yeah, we're back and we're heavy and we're hard and we're not gonna give you nice shit. <laughs> and then it goes into the second song, five minutes eight seconds, disaster piece. So, Gary, I don't know if you've heard Tim and I talk about it on the show. We have the second song theory, where if you th- yeah. if the best way to know if an album is going to be good is skip the first song, go right to the second. Ah, and if the second song yeah. is a monster, you know that the whole album is going to be good. This and the self-titled are perfect examples, right? Because totally. the second t- self- self-titled starts in with the, the drum and bass. Mm-hmm. This one starts off with that evil, where you're like, and then it's the galloping drums yeah. in it. Yeah. yeah. But it's well, the drumming monster. in this record is fucking unbelievably good. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. I did not appreciate Joey Jordison back then like I do now when I go back and I listen with headphones on. And mm. man, that dude had some fucking chops. Yeah. He's, yeah. His he fills were down. insane. Yes. Yeah, yeah, dude, I was just going to say that. His, his fills will go down as some of the best ever. So good. Mm-hmm. It carries the emotion from just like one part to the next. It just like it brings you anticipation and then like the tension and release like none other. So good. Yeah, the, the this song right here, man. I mean, come on. It's got that. It's got the classic line. I want to slit your throat and fuck the wound. Yeah. I mean, come <laughs> Which on. Every 60 year old kid is like, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's an iconic line for them right there. Oh, okay. you know I mean, <laughs> I mean, to your point, Tim, there's a there's, there's a mosh riff in the verse. Mm-hmm. Right. Blast, he's blasting during the chorus. There's that that blast run. I think it's like three minutes and twenty seconds, where he's just. It's like, yo, what? Like, unless <laughs> you'd heard. I mean, imagine like to Gary's point, right? Gary, you were fairly mm. young. Yeah. Like these these poor kids, Tim, that had never heard Cannibal Corpse, had never heard mm. Pete Sandoval and Morbid Angel, Terrorizer, or Napalm Death, right? And they get Slipknot, and it's like, yo, what? Is that, a, is that a, is that an adding machine? Like how are they making how are they making that noise? It's right. unbelievable. Yeah. What, no, but, what, yeah. Do you remember Gary? Like what was at what point were you looking at this album going, hold like what did I get myself into? Pretty much like upon finish finishing my first play, listen of people people equal shit going into disaster piece, going through the middle of that song already. I'm just like at that point. That was like already the, the angriest thing I had ever heard at that point. I mean, it's it's still it's still one yeah. of the angriest things I I know now. I mean, after years of dip, digging into death metal, grindcore, and stuff, still this album is just so angry and in your face and unabashed at doing that. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, yeah, back then, yeah, it just crushed me. Like just a couple songs. This this the second track theory, yeah. <laughs> Uh, unabashed Dude. is a good adjective because yeah. they it, literally there is no sense of embarrassment it's we're gonna go yep get on get no, on the how, fucking train here we go how about yeah. the bridge part of this song where it just goes into that double bass part the Ooh, yes. Yes. dude yep yeah so sick uh we, we've talked about this tim and gary is a musician i threw you can relate the importance mm-hmm. of writing a damn good bridge yeah mm, super it's, it's, it's crucial bridges and pre-choruses i am convinced make a song if you can nail that to those two parts yes the rest will fall itself it falls in yeah that those are like the the that it goes into the tension and release and anticipation because that's Mm -hmm. just like it's kind of what makes music like it's like because you want to submerse yourself into it and those two types of sections and songs they make that happen the they 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 manipulate your emotion Mm -hmm. to get into it yeah, yeah, and and a, and a good producer will know when to automate it after parts like that, because then Ooh, like, because yeah. the the certain you know maybe like not saying you you don't know what I'm talking about Jay, but like a certain like a just a novice listener of music, they won't really understand that part of that. So after your bridge part, Mm-mm. your automation goes up and it just brings it more to the forefront and it mm-hmm. kicks your ass even more. Like yeah. it's a so so basically what it is, Jay is. The the producer the mixer will go in and raise the dynamics of certain parts. Like they'll they'll put the double bass down, but higher the guitar, so it's more okay. in your face. Okay, I got you. They, they yeah. change that, the that's mix. basically and, what it is. Certain there, parts, right? yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm um, explaining that right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I I, okay. I I I love doing that too because it's it, it kind of goes hand in hand with like the the manipulation of the listener's emotions. Like, oh, I'm feeling this more at this section of whatever song, 
and then it's going to change the yeah the like the dynamics you said it's going to change yep. when it gets to different parts yeah so i'm not a musician right in you guys definition right um but there's a guy i gotta send you his name is I'm going to butcher Ted Goya, Goya, whatever. He's an old A&R hmm. guy from the music industry. And he writes okay. his blog posts about the music industry and not about the leveling, but he talks about one of the posts he had, which I thought was brilliant. The importance of a key change in the middle of a song. Ooh, and okay. he talked about the example he gives. And I'm going to say this and everyone listening is going to stop and hear it in their heads. It's the second chorus of Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson, where the gospel chorus comes in. That goes up a full half step. And I guarantee wow. you right now, we all just got chills thinking about it because it does. It gives you chills because it's yep. such a huge step. And yep. he, he had a whole, if I find it, I'll put it in the show notes and send it to you two guys. But yeah. it's, I never thought about it that way. But it really does. It's almost like an emotional lifting experience where you're bitterly taking everybody and yeah. going straight up with it. That's but I so mean, I get, I get chills thinking about it. But yeah, I'll send it to you guys. It's, it's, but again, it's like bridges it's automation. and courses. Yeah. Like yeah. you need to, that's something you need to consciously say, all right, we're going to do this now. Mm -hmm. And it literally, I mean, the only way to describe it is you raise the roof. Like yep. you totally just take it up a whole nother level. Yeah. A, a band that probably does the automation a lot is Fear Factory because all the Ooh. double kick parts. Yeah. And then especially like if you listen to Fear Factory, especially new stuff, when they get towards the end of the song, you always hear the keyboards up in the mix higher because they're giving you they're giving you the outro of the song and they're raising the dynamic there. So mm -hmm. that's a good if people want to know what that really means. Listen to any new Fear Factory. And as the song goes, you'll start hearing the electronics more. That's basically yeah. what I'm trying to say. That's great producing. They, they've, yeah. they've had a really great knack for that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the yeah. So changing the dynamic is just yeah. It, it's it's everything, man. Yeah. I mean, and, and at this point, we've talked about this. That there are so many talented musicians out there that you need to find a way to differentiate yourself, right? Speed yeah. no longer does it, right? We've all yeah. we've all watched John Longstreth <laughs> do it live. It's like, yo, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I mean, he's I, a master of that. Yeah, he can pull, he can, he can, <laughs> the guy's blasting, and he looks like he's actually bored. He's like, yo, can I get a cup of coffee? And <laughs> You can't compete with that. You gotta you gotta take it a different direction. Um, so you true. know who you know who Jay you know who else does that a lot in his songs is Hunter in Mood Ring. If you listen to mm. the end of Mood Ring songs, his voice goes a different key a lot of the times. He goes yes, he will go up a pitch. Which yeah. I, shout out to Hunter. I mean, I, I yeah. reached out to him. I know he's he's been busy, but I'm trying to get him back on the show. He's another one of those guys who just has the ear. He yeah, just has the ear for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now let's go to track four, the third official song, My Flag, three minutes, 40 seconds. Yeah. Gary, thoughts on this one? So I'll, I'll say right out the gate, this is actually my favorite track on the album. Um, it kind of, for, for me, uh, my my taste in Slipknot, it kind of has everything that I love about them, uh, like transitioning from the self-titled, because it almost feels like just a heavier version of what embodies uh the strongest moments of self-titled like it's it just takes it up to another level while still having you know a bit of the a bit of the clean singing in there you know it's not like super up front but it's just like hinted in there just uh, just a little bit um so that yeah um it's definitely my favorite song um and i guess it's it's also i think one of the most efficient songs on there so it kind of just like goes straight to the point um i mean a lot of the album goes straight to the point, but that one kind of <laughs> does it, <laughs> does it more for me at least. Yeah. Okay. Tim. Yeah, I, I agree, man. An another fucking great track. The, the chorus in this, in this track is yeah. on amazing. I, 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 I remember when he, when he, <clears throat> when I was listening to this again, I heard the clean parts in this. I was like, I don't remember in the self-titled him doing like blatant cleans. And then I went no. back and listened to it, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm kind of right, but I'm kind of not at the same time." Because yeah, he did yeah. certain stuff like that, but this is like where blatantly he puts the cleans in, and I'm, right. I'm a fan of that shit, man. I love no, yeah. that stuff. Yeah, my, my <laughs> notes are: this is the heaviest of heavy radio songs for 2001. Yeah, yes. right. Like <laughs> that hits they, the they, nail on the head. They yeah. kind of it was kind of <clears throat> like, "Hey, Gary, what if we write a radio song?" but we fucking destroy it. And you're like, yes. I mean, yes. that's basically what they did. I mean, yeah. like to your point, it's incredible. The, the clean vocals on the chorus. Right. And and there's some really, you know, there's, there's a fast four in the background, mm -hmm. but it's still really abrasive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just put the song on real quick to just remind me and do the intro of this song. Another amazing part of this record. 
Yeah, the kegs. I got a mic a keg. So I'm good. never gonna unhear that. I'm never gonna hear <laughs> that. I got a mic a keg with a baseball bat. Like, <laughs> yeah, these. Yeah, this is like fight riffs in this song, man. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's it's just another great. So you have four great tracks in a row. Ooh, yep. And and it gets better, right? So then we go from my plague. Then we go to everything ends. Four minutes, fourteen seconds. Um, I mean, just think about how the song starts it sounds like the music is melting yeah you are all fucked and overrated i think i'm gonna be sick it's your fault this is the end of everything you are the end of everything like amazing intro like are, are you kidding me again this is slipknot saying yeah we're not doing radio songs people <laughs> sorry like here yep. we come and holy shit like and this is a great song what is it? What does he say after that? I haven't slept since I woke and found my whole life was a life lie. Life was a lie, motherfucker. motherfucker. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He he did get shit. By the way, he got uh, funny enough. I said the word shit. Uh, he got shit for saying. Uh, apparently, he said shit and fuck like a thousand times. What is it? Um, <laughs> Damn. They they talked about he used that word, um, forty times in Iowa's sixty six minutes. <laughs> the words fucking shit. Amazing. I mean, uh, it's not Fitz. as good as Fred, Fred Durst saying, if I say fuck twice, two more times, there's 46 fucks in this fucked up rhyme. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But I mean, this song is, it's this is, you know, back to the story that Tim shared in the beginning about how they were all just at their wits end. Mm. This is ba- this basically sounds like somebody who's like, I've had it with all you people. I, go away. I don't need it. Yeah, the, I mean, the now that I think about it, this is probably one of the best this is one of the best songs on the record i don't know if it's my yeah. favorite but it's one of the best ones on here yeah definitely because this you... one where where jay said the sledgehammer thing this one just fucking punishes you yes oh yeah what what, what tuning was this and was this drop b oh, f, f. <laughs> I, can't, I i can't remember i feel like it was drop b but maybe drop a uh, this was I, this was six string though. This is I don't think they right. ever did. Yeah, so. it was yeah, it was six. Um, man, I can't remember. Let's see. The tuning says everything ends. Uh, tuning A E A D F sharp. Okay, B. it's so a drop A. a. Yeah. Drop A. Yeah. Okay. That, that, yeah, that, that that's that's drop A on a six. Yeah, on a six. Yeah, nice. Yeah, on a on a seven, it's A E A. Then the then the standard after that. Mm, Every good mm-hmm. boy deserves fudge. I took a year theory. I can transpose. <laughs> Don't, ask me to nice. write it. Don't ask me to write it. Um, <laughs> so we've got we've got a abrasive intro. People equal shit. Disaster piece. My plague and everything ends. Where Corey literally sounds like he's about to give up. And yeah. then we go to, I'm sorry, this is my favorite song on the album. There's a story nice. behind it. Uh the heretic anthem, four minutes, 13 seconds. So let me let me tell you guys the story. August 10th. 2001 i'm at my girlfriend's house at the time it's some birthday party for one of her sorority sisters and i know that slipknot is going to be on conan that night to to play yes and if you go on youtube and you watch the video no kegs right you just have chris fenn and clown were there just singing but conan's like hey i like i have a conan ryan here's a man from slipknot to play their song you know the heretic anthem yep and then they fucking just nuke the place. And it's like, can you imagine like some normal person? And I will give Conan credit. Conan always had a lot of new metal on his show. He always yeah. was very different. But, you know, this was like a, f- and and so this whole party of all these, these girls are yelling and screaming and they're drinking box wine or whatever. And me and another dude are just standing in the front of the TV like this. <laughs> so their mouths agape, blinking, blinking, just watching what, what? What are these guys doing? And it was it was unbelievable. Oh, and to yeah. your point, Gary, about um, Left Behind comes out as a video. Mm-hmm. You have you know, so I hadn't heard the album. I hear this, and I'm like, oh, you know, I want yeah. more of this. And then I hear Left Behind. I'm like, well, what the fuck is this? Like, which way is the album going to go? Right. And, and just yeah, I, I've I've nerded that about this enough. But yeah, that's my that's my heretic anthem story i think it, oh, yeah. i think it's the I, best song on the album i do remember watching that on conan with, with my friends we had like a like a sleepover because we knew that that was going on and and we were just like oh it was almost like you know i mean we're yeah like 13 14 it was it was like a party like we're watching slipknot on tv on basic tv uh it was crazy yeah i have to i have to watch it i'm sure i've seen it before but i have to watch it, it, it yeah. Tim, it's, it's, it's fun yeah, it's <clears throat> it's something complete. It's literally completely insane, because <laughs> because they just go for it and they're all in costumes and it's like 
can you imagine being the studio audience like hey you know like and they 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 record a couple out a couple episodes back to back so like hey the first mm. band's like third eye blind and they're gonna sing jumper and the <laughs> second band is uh is i don't know like fucking marcy playground sex and candy and then we have this <laughs> band called slipknot i don't really and, you know, you're gonna get your face melted off like i, yeah. I wish they had a live cam of the audience just Ooh. like they probably what is do, going on here. <laughs> I'll have to search for it. We definitely yeah. have to do. Um, it, it, it's a great song, dude. Home, you're wrong, but this is one of them songs where, like, if I didn't hear it again for a while, I wouldn't care. You know what I mean? Like, it's a great song, but it's like one of them songs that's so overplayed where it's kind of like, eh. mm, I get it. I get it's it. Kind of like to, wait and bleed fair. on the first record. Yeah, right. I guess that's fair. But to, to me, this is like the equivalent to this with a different album. Um, Eleventh Hour by Lamb of God. On as the palace is burned. When I pull mm. up that album, when I pull up this album, I go right to those songs, and then I let the rest play out. That's fair. Go wrong yeah. with that. Yeah, just, just amazing. So, and then we go to okay. So we've got, we've just got fucking, um, we've got four minutes and thirteen seconds of complete insanity, yeah. and then they, Buster Rhymes flip mode it into track number seven, gently. gently. Four minutes fifty four seconds. Gary coming off of Herod again. Mm-hmm. Is there another way they could have followed that song, but what with they did with what they did with guilt uh, with gently? So, I kind of okay. So <clears throat> I have kind of two different uh, fractured opinions on this. So as a kid, when I first heard this, I was all about it because I at at that point I had never heard anything like gently. Like it's it's kind of um, what's the word like um i mean it's kind of plotting and it's like brooding Mm -hmm. um it like you said it flips the script of these first uh, six songs um where it's just high energy high energy then gently drags it down it like kind of just wrenches your heart and pulls it down to a kind of a crawl back then i i loved it um to be honest over the years i kind of feel like I'm not as hot on it now, uh, even though I've like I've gotten into like slower other slower music over the years and and sludgy things. I love that side of metal and stuff. But mm-hmm. uh, on this album, I feel like they could have kept it going like high energy or so, something um, right out the gate, like in the song. Maybe maybe at the end of the song, okay. come to a crawl. That's my opinion uh, of like you know if 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 I was somehow a producer back a co-producer back then that's what i would have done or could have seen them doing um but you know i'm sure there, there's there's differing opinions on on gently and where it falls on the album Tim, yeah I, thoughts? I i agree 100 with with gary um to me this sounds like a song that some other band would have wrote as their closer for a record yes yes yep yep it's like a, I, it sounds like a closer, but even with the song being titled "Gently," I guess they're like, "Here's our interlude," yeah, and then we're well, gonna get right back and beat the shit out of you. Yep. Yeah, I I kind of take it. So I I don't know if I liked it when I was younger, but now I took a different approach. Where when you go that aggressive mm-hmm. with with Heretic Anthem, you either like to your point, Gary, you either have to up it again and you have to keep climbing, or you mm-hmm. got to take you got to hit the release valve, bring it down, and then build it back up. Yeah. And I think this is the only real way they probably could have followed Herod together, but but I think all you hear is the dunk, you know, the the symbol, the 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 what's it called? The the what's at the top of the symbol called? Oh, uh, the triangle. Uh, the the tent, bell. The bell. Right. The bell. Mm-hmm. He's leading with the bell, but people forget that at three minutes and forty eight seconds into this song, the fucking wheels come off. And then they're like, yeah. "All right, well, here we are. <laughs> Fuck it. We could we tried, but we couldn't fix it. Yeah, and we're." back into the grind yeah i i really i think i think tim and i talk about sequencing a lot gary where Mm -hmm. you know how you sequence your album is almost as important as the songs you write yes and because it makes them better or worse i think this is the best way they could have solved followed up that insanity was something that you're starts out slow and then builds its way up to where it was that's fair yeah yeah I mean, they they did a good job of doing all of that. So I mean, because it it leaves you wondering what's next, mm-hmm. and I think that that's a perfect way to do that, especially back then. Because nowadays, like everything is just like let's take for example that Humanity's Last Breath record is just a mm-hmm. pummeling after pummeling. No, I mean that record is yeah. fucking if amazing. If you're listening or watching, pause this episode. 
go check out the new Humanities Last Breath album. I don't know what I was expecting. It's insane, dude, but it's so fun. I got my good. fucking socks blown. Like I, 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 I don't. It, it take take the the gent guitar tone, mm-hmm. the 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 polymeter of Meshuga, and just the the aggression of modern deathcore. But then throw some hardcore shit in there, mm-hmm. right? Some hardcore breakdown <clears throat> time signatures, and I, that album is the perfect example of not. And the word I'm going to use is overdoing it. Yeah. Right yeah. at no point does it feel like, yo, did you really need to layer another fucking track in here? It's <laughs> just stripped down enough that it works. Yeah, I agree. Dude, it's the soundtrack to where you enter hell. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, dude. Uh, that I don't shit know about you, crazy. Tim, but when I die and go to hell, uh, I'm pretty sure the Dave Matthews band is going to be playing on fucking music. It's going to yeah, be so man. much to say. He's going to be dancing around on fucking That's stage. That's funny. What am I want to kill myself. <laughs> uh, okay, so we leave behind gently. Uh, la ha. Wow. Pun, and we go into number eight, left behind, four minutes and one second. Tim, first time you thought the song, what did you th- heard the song? What did you think? Was it the video? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's a good track, but to me, this is exactly where volume three went. This is volume three mm-hmm. in a nutshell to me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think that this is where they, you know, I think from the popularity of the song, they, they took it and ran with it on the rest of their discography, honestly. Yeah. I think I think this is for their sound, this is about the about the best radio single they could have written mm-hmm. because there's just enough slipknot in it that you can hear it, but it also has it, it, it's catchy. There's an earworm there. There's an yeah. earworm there. Speaking of earworms, Tim, don't let me forget this. We need to find someone to deep dive fantastic planet with us. Oh, hell Ooh. yeah. Because I am convinced that is one of, if not the perfect album to come out of the 90s. Uh, moving along. So I remember, again, I saw this video in the airport and I was like, ah, really? Yeah. Power again? Really? Uh, I didn't like it when I was younger, skinnier, Jay. Not that much skinnier. I had <laughs> two chins, not four. Um, <laughs> but when I listened to it again today, you know what I found when I, I listened to one, I listened to this album three times straight through, no fast forwarding. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth time I skipped around. This is one of the songs I went to. It was Herod Degantham, Gently, Left Behind, and then I would start bouncing around. But nice. I, I really do think it's a well-written, it's a well-written radio song. I agree. I, I, I kind of feel that it, it it on this record, and then now fast forward looking back in retrospect, it's kind of like this is the perfect radio slipknot song in terms of like just what they what they embody when they do write radio songs mm-hmm. like it, it it just it's perfect and like you said it has <clears throat> it has the right amount of slipknot as we knew them up until that point like it has that the early heavy slipknot while still being catchy what yeah while not being too radio rock yeah but it's it's to your point it, i i definitely will die on this hill that this song i i think I'm gonna say my hot take right here. Yeah, I, I think after this record they went to shit. Oh, and I second think and I think that this third, this song third, is third. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> and I think that sorry, this guys. song sorry, is, listeners. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but I think that this song right here is the reason that they go that 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 route. Because mm-hmm. like I said before, every other record is just this song over and over again. Yeah. Uh, but is it is it this song? Or I, in my and we, Gary, we just did a spicy new metal take episode, mm. and one of my spicy takes was Stone Sour ruined Slipknot. And I is yep. it this song, Tim, or is it the stuff he did with Stone Sour bleeding into? Because there's some, I mean, when we when we deep dive it, there's some really abrasive parts in mm. Volume Three. Like there's some yeah. blasting, and there's some there's some hints of the old Slipknot. But I, I, I kind of think Corey got tired of screaming. Maybe. maybe, maybe. Maybe. I also think the first Stone Sour record is great. I'm not gonna lie. I think that's a great record. There's some really. I, good songs I revisited it, and I I do like it. Yeah. Yeah. There's great songs on that record, man. There really is. Uh, but to me, this is where they. they I'll, I'll take your word for it. For them. I never fuck with Stone Sour. I never fuck with Murder Dolls. I don't really care. I really. Don't. Oh, again, back to my hot take. No new metal, but band, but Limp Bizkit put out more than two good albums. 
Don't have me. I don't want to hear it. Uh, moving along. So after Left Behind, arguably their big single, this is the thing that helps mm-hmm. propel them to touring arenas. And then the next mm-hmm. album, we go to track number nine, The Shape. Three minutes and 37 seconds. Gary, what did you make of this one? I thought this was like the perfect song to come right after Left Behind, um, especially with how, uh, yeah, how catchy uh, Left Behind was. Um, I think that, and, and I'll kind of keep going through my lens of, of as a kid, uh, processing this album, um, the kind of, at, at this point, the up, the kind of ups and downs of this album, you know, especially after like Gently and Left Behind. Uh, I think the shape picks off like really good kind of of the early, earlier parts of this album's energy and intensity. Um, and it, and it kind of goes back again. Like it's, it's, it's an efficient song, a three and a half. Yeah. Three, three thirty seven. Yep. Um, so it's like, I, I actually don't know if this is my second favorite, but it, on this album, but it's, it's up there. Um, I'm a big fan of the song and they kind of, uh, kind of show, show their colors of just like how intense they can get on this song. Tim? He Gary nailed it again for me. My second favorite track on the record, the chorus of this is the best chorus on the record for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I, I can, just I love that. that singing part in there. Um, I forget what he says exactly, but I love the chorus in this song. It's it's yeah, it's my second favorite track, and I'll go back to it. Um, yeah, my my plague is is my favorite track on this record. Hell yeah, yeah, definitely same. Um, the shape. <clears throat> I forget how nasty the intro is. Yeah. Right, the the verse. Where it's just Corey and the snare and hi hat, yes. like there there is something yep. to be said <clears throat> about simplicity, and I think to, you know, and I'm not, I'm going to use humanity's last breath as the as the other end of that, right? Mm-hmm. There's bands that can layer and do it just just beautifully, but there's something to be said about a band that can go down to like one instrument out of all of them and the vocalist and still make it a That's aggressive intense. sound. Yeah. But I think that that um that contrast helps it sound really wild and to your point tim my big my big note here it's start and underline this is a highly singable chorus yeah yeah, yeah. what's he say i lost my only one yeah, yeah. software or something like that yeah. yeah 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 great fucking track man yeah and, and so from here we go to the I, I guess this is the late of the second half of the album um mm-hmm. we're gonna go to i am hated two minutes 37 seconds this right here, I'll go first. Sorry. Yeah. This right here to me sounds like a B-side from the self-titled record. If you listen to this song again, mm, this yeah. sounds like it should have been on the self-titled record. It literally sounds like a song that they wrote for that record. Didn't like it. Come to this record. They need a track because at this point, we're at 14 tracks for this mm. record. Yeah. You got to remember back then, labels, especially like Roadrunner, they wanted long records. Yeah. They wanted fill, that full fill 74 that minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that this, runtime. If, if when when this is when this is over, go listen to this song again. And I guarantee you'll say, wow, this does sound like a self-titled song. Because to me, this is a self-titled song that didn't make it. I, and they I, rewrote I it over there. This is the last song I like on this album. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah. It's a little funky, a little rappy, a little bit, yeah, you're right. Very much a first a self-titled song. Yeah. Very much. Yeah, it um, is, man. And, and and I didn't pick it up when I was a kid, right? Because when we're kids, we just pick up, oh, yeah, I hate my parents. But mm-hmm. this whole album up to this point is very, very aggressive and 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 turbocharged. Mm-hmm. And now for me, this is the part where it starts stumbling by the wayside, if I'm going to be honest. Yeah, that's um, fair. I, I, it's funky and rappy and it's not bad. But to your point, Tim, now that you've said that, it definitely is more of a self-titled than an Iowa. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you guys agree with that. I, yeah, it, it kind of feels like, hey, we can still do s- some of the some of the more blatant, rappy, new metal isms of the self titled. So that that's going to be on Iowa. Or this is that part of on Iowa's version. But yeah. I I kind of do yeah see like this could have been a self titled track for sure. Absolutely, man. It's I listened to it twice in a row, and I'd listened to it the first time, and I'm like, dude, like, mm-hmm. man, why was this not on the self titled? Like, yeah, yep. When when they took off purity, they could have added this song in there instead Ooh. of what's his name because the song that they added for purity, I forget what it's called. Um, uh, inside me inside. 
dude, it's that song is good, but it's not. Yeah. It doesn't take from the self titled. It's like a completely different song mm-hmm. that should have been on a different record. That's just my opinion because when you listen to it, I'm like, this song does not fit on here. Right. On the inside, yeah. Mm. It. I don't think uh, it fits on that record. I understand why, why they did it because why, they had though? to. Why don't it, you think it fits? Is it because honestly, he's blasting where that's more of that on Iowa? You think they yeah, it sounds like. Them? It sounds like they could have swapped them two songs. That's fair. That's just I can see opinion. that. That's interesting. I could see that. Yeah, listen to them back to back and you'll see what I mean. Yeah. Okay, so we come off of I Am Hated and we go into Skin Ticket, track number 11. Six, man, six minutes, 41 seconds. This is a long one. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Tim. I think I think they should have ended the record here. Like you said, I th- after, at this point, it gets a little long for me. Mm-hmm. Um, good track. It's a little, it, it's a little too long though. And I wonder if that band skin ticket got there, got the name from this, that hardcore band. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I bet. Absolutely. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. It's a cool name. Don't get me wrong. I love it. Yeah. I just think they could have ended the record right here and I would have been satisfied. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, I, I was going to say, I share that opinion too. Um, even on my latest list, I, I listened to it yesterday, the, the album yesterday, front to back. And I was like, yeah, I think this kind of could have been could have been cut off, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe maybe late, maybe it used as um uh, a bonus track, what have you, but not on like the official uh, official official version. Yeah, yeah, like the Japan re-release or something. Right, right. Yeah, they, the, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the, yep. Special. I edition. probably would have ended it after. I would have done probably the shape, and then I would have put Iowa. And then you're right, everything else because mm, mm. skin tickets. So this to me, I have um the, the song above I am hated. I just wrote meh skin ticket. I write, <laughs> oh look, more meh. I, it's <laughs> and, and it's a long, long it is meh. Yeah. Yeah, I and, mean and, they it definitely falls off after um the last track. The fuck is it called again? I am hate it definitely falls off. Right. And so we go from skin ticket to new abortion. Number 12, this is 3 minutes, 36 seconds. Again, not bad, but yeah. probably could have. And, well, and, and so let me ask you to this. Do we think it the album gets long in the tooth? Because very, very early on, it was almost like a pendulum where they swing it one way and it's really abrasive, really aggressive, really heavy, hard. And like, I'm going to punch you in the face. And mm-hmm. then they swing it the other way where it's radio friendly it's accessible it's singable it's hummable Mm -hmm. do you think it's because these songs they don't really go too far off the median like they don't deviate too far enough from the mean that you're like i either want heavy or i want hard but yeah yeah, you're kind of giving me in between you're kind of just giving me baked chicken and white rice and i i I, I need the fra diablo buddy like i need the fra diablo Dial it up or you go the other way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I definitely Um, get that. Yeah. And so we go, because you can take it with new abortion, metabolic. I I actually think metabolic is probably, again, this is, I know Roadrunner loved 74 minutes. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is a throwaway track as far as I'm concerned. Do you guys disagree? Well, listen, these last three tracks could have been left behind. Get it? Yeah. But I'm bumped. Tim, put that sound in in post. So (laughs) what do you guys think about the closer? So it's 15 minutes iowa what do you think about the closer what's your honest thoughts i still haven't listened to this track in full i, I oh damn. i'm not doing a 15 minute track i can't do it I, I <laughs> ADHD it kicks in. It's like yo I, I sounds, through like 90 it seconds yeah. Songs. yeah there you go um yeah. i did listen to parts of it it's it's definitely it doesn't surprise me because of who produced the record so ross likes mm-hmm. to get ross likes to get the emotion out of bands at the end uh daddy with from corn, mm-hmm. um, what's the last song on Life Is Peachy called again? I forget. Uh, uh, is it Kill You? I think it's Kill You. Yeah, yeah Kill You. That song, um, he gets all the emotion out of Jonathan again. This song right here, he gets all the emotion out of Corey. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's cool for what he does, but fifteen minutes for me, it's it's too fucking long. It's a cool track for what it is, though. I I agree, and it's like I like. I like the son the sig like the sonic signature of what's happening in the song, but maybe edit it edit it down uh in in, in runtime. Um because I, I like what's going on in it because it's it's cool as a closer. Mm-hmm. It's 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 the the album's name, you know. I get what they were going for emotionally, 
sonically, but I think 15 minutes probably was running a bit too hot. Um, yep. And I, I, I did think that back then as a kid and I still think that now. So yeah, I, I think, you know, maybe it just could have been cut down a bit. And, and like we've said, like probably cut the last, the, the previous like couple few songs. Yeah. I, I would not be mad at all with that. Right. Yeah. My, my note was, this is a typical self-indulgent rambling quasi instrumental outro typical of the time. Yep. Mm, you nailed right? it. Very, yeah. uh, typical of the time. Um, I did go back and I, and I found some interviews about the story behind Iowa and how they all hated each other. And um, this was that, you know, this was their big middle finger. They were, they were so tired. And I, I, I think this is it, when you read those articles, which talk about how pissed off they were and they were trying yeah. to ruin other people's expectations and fuck you roadrunner. You think you're going to get rich <laughs> off us. We're going to make a grind core album, right? Like, um, which I think, I think angel Dust tried to do that with their last two albums. And it didn't work out too well for them. Um, <laughs> probably shouldn't have said that. There we go. Um, but that being said, this was like the, this was the giant, all right, can we all just come together and just admit that okay, it's over and it's done and we're putting it to bed? And and sadly, mm-hmm. I mean, this most fans of our age, right? Um, because mm-hmm. we're all within five years of one another. This is basically them putting their career to bed because they go on to Stone Sourish and Slipknot Light, and yeah, it's it kind of becomes a parody of itself. I hate to yeah. say it out loud, but it's kind of true. Cr- clown, come on yeah. the show. <laughs> yeah, right. I- and I've, I've, I remember reading um, probably a f- several different or a few different interviews where they had expressed thoughts back then where they probably almost could have ended after Iowa, but they didn't. And and I think sometimes they wish that they did. Um, but obviously, you know, history uh, tells a different story. Yeah. But what, you know, who knows what that could have been like if, if, if it's just Iowa as they cap it at that, uh, you know, kind of this extreme end. Um, well, he's yeah, definitely not putting out country songs. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> what is it, Corey fucking Taylor or some shit? Uh, is that yeah. the record? Something you, you, like you that. Pretty, you pretty much, when, when, when your band members start putting out solo records, you kind of know your career's on a tailspin, and it's kind of at the end of it. Because, mm. I mean, at this point, how many members have died? Two, right? Yeah. Two and two have left. Mm-hmm. Two have left. So yeah, obviously you get a new drummer, but he 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 left before he passed, right? I don't yeah, know why. Jo- yeah. Joey yep. left before he passed. Paul was still a member of the band. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and Craig just left and Chris Fenn just left. Or okay. left not not just. He's left a bit ago. Yeah, he was forced but, out, wasn't he? But I mean, honestly, I mean, think yeah. about it. We, we we talk about this week over week. It's it's imagine being stuck in a fucking bus with nine other dudes, plus your merch guy, plus your manager, plus your sound guy, mm. touring the country nonstop. I mean, all those little idiosyncrasies. I mean, it's hard enough to cohabitate with a woman, right? With a partner. Yeah. And you're stuck with other dudes who are who are abrasive and smell and are obnoxious, <laughs> like I, I can drunk see high. temper. Yeah, drunk and right. high. I can see tempers kind of flaring out of control. I can see people being yeah. like, you know what? I don't fucking need this. Egos, whoa, whoa. all kinds of stuff mashing that, together. Yes. That's a big part is the ego thing. And I think Corey is the biggest um one with that because he is mm-hmm. gone off the rails, if you ask me. Like mm-hmm. what what's the big quote on Metal Sucks? What does Corey Tower think? Mm-hmm. Every little oh, story yeah. that happens, everything. Right? It, it's everything has to do with that, and I kind of find it funny. But like, <laughs> I know a lot of people, a lot of people find him to be a cunt. But you can't, you can't deny how fucking talented that dude is. Oh yeah, yeah, he's a fucking super talented vocalist, man. Absolutely, Cl- clean and harsh. You know, there's yeah, no yeah. doubt about it. You can't, you can't deny that from him, man. So I mean. But but like I said before, I think they go to shit after this record, and I don't really care about anything after this. There, there's some good songs on like the yeah. later stuff. Yeah. Um, the record that they put out a couple of years ago, there's some really good tracks on there, but it just goes to shit most of the time, and I just don't really care for it. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've gone through a revisit of of their whole discography, and I'm I, yeah, I share the same opinion where it's like, man, I really truly only fuck with self titled in Iowa, like through and yeah. through. Yeah. It's it's uh, kind of like corn, you know what I mean? Like 
the first two records are masterpiece records. They're genre defining records, obviously, but like mm. follow the leaders good. But after that, man, it's like, I can listen to issues I, and stuff, but like, uh, oh, I'll even I don't say know f- what it is. <laughs> I, I personally do love issues. Follow the leader falls apart after the first half. I, I, I could see it. I could see why. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it, it's definitely a, a change for sure. And, and another, then again, another you album have, we have to, to deep dive and I have to hate myself when we do it. But yeah, it's... <laughs> then again, you have to remember how big corn got after yeah. follow the leader. I mean, that was that's Huge. their that's their Iowa right there. You know what I mean? Right. That, that well, that was them. They left Ross behind. They got a whole new producer. And that's mm-hmm. another album we haven't deep dove yet. Hmm. Um maybe we should. Oh well, uh, us three can do it. Fuck it. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. uh, I'm sorry. After after I'm looking at it now, and the last good song is BBK. Maybe you reclaim my place. After that, it just goes to shit. I I love that record actually. It is actually one of my favorites. Really? I do agree. There's yeah. some. Um, there are a couple stinkers on it from my point of view, but overall, I do love the record. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Justin's a great track. Yeah, yeah, and, and pretty and- emotional. I yeah. will give them credit. So you figure Freak on a Leash is clo- as close to the old corn you're going to get. Sure. Um, I actually, when it first came out, <clears throat> I loved Got the Life. Yeah. Because that's a that's a four on the floor disco it's a song. Party. Yeah. And I'm new sorry. Disco. There, there, <laughs> if you go on all these, Tim and I are members of every new metal Facebook group, Instagram, Hell yeah, okay. whatever. A lot of times people shit on David Silveria oh, saying what? he was part of the problem. I'm sorry, but they have never come close to replacing his drumming. Ooh, 100% his drumming never. is is he was Go incredible. Back and listen, he yeah. is a he is basically a jazz drummer playing in a fucking heavier band. Yeah, Dude. all the little uh, funky things he does did amazing. Yeah, yes. I mean, I don't know what happened to him after he left. I mean, he got he definitely put on a lot of weight and he well, had the health problems and stuff, yeah, which, which a, is fine. Whatever. Yeah. He was mm-hmm. interviewed and he said that he had tons of back problems oh, and he yeah. ended up with like a couple of, I think he ended up with a couple of vertebrae that ended up being fused. And Damn. I mean, can you imagine his, what that does to a drummer? His, oh, his discography after this is, oh boy. <laughs> I can't say I've heard it. Uh, any of his post corn stuff. Yeah. Check it out. And you're going to, I, I would love <laughs> oh, to man. interview him though. So if, if he's yeah. listened, I'm not shitting on you, dude. I would love to talk. Oh, to you. David. Yeah. Come on the show. We would love to hang out and chat. I would love to hear like, what do you think of the newest Cannibal Corpse album? <laughs> yeah, but his, his drumming was impeccable, dude. I mean, they yeah. they they made them like Life is Peachy. He made that record, dude. Oh yeah, the drumming on that record is fucking incredible. The grooves, all the little cymbal fills, and everything. Yeah, yeah, yes. Like I've tried playing along the drums on the first two records, and I'm like, bro, how the fuck did he do that? Fuck. Like it's crazy shit, dude. Great drummer, but yeah, we're talking about something out here. Joey's drumming is just as good, if not better. Yeah. But in a different way, in a more yeah. violent way. And he, uh, dude, rest in peace, that dude, amazing drummer, a, amazing musician. He played guitar, all that stuff. So one of the best. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, a lot of these songs were written directly by him. So you got to give it to him, man. Seriously. It is kind of wild yeah. that him and Paul wrote most of the music. It's pretty wild. Yeah. The low end, taking taking the foothold. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Let, let, let's do this. Um, we'll start with Gary. Out of ten, what do you give this record? Ooh, okay. So through and through. Um, you know, I I would say I would say a seven out of ten. Okay. It has some extremely high points and it has some meh lower points, but overall, I'd say seven out of ten. I I agree one hundred percent. It's a seven for me as well. Nice. Uh, I'm gonna give it an eight. Mm. Not to be difficult, but. Gary is right. There are some low points, mm-hmm. but I think the high points vastly overshadow the low points. I can points. see that. Yeah. I mean, if you cut this down to 10 tracks, Ooh. including an outro, it'd be a masterpiece. Right? Or, or nine tracks, an intro and an outro, mm-hmm. it's a banger. Like Tim and I talk about, there's some albums that we've heard where, yo, make that an EP, mm. and you have people literally trying to hurt their unborn <laughs> children. Right? It, it's <laughs> insane. Uh, but I, I would give it. I would give it a solid eight. This was okay. The yeah. monster. So you know, we were talking about. Um, I think we can't. We can't end before we acknowledge. Did you? Do we? Did either of you have? Do you have disaster pieces? The DVD. Yeah, I did have it. Um, I think I. I think I gave it to a friend as a gift. Um, 
but I did have it. Yeah, we we watched it together, and I was like, man, you know what? You can have this. Um, because I think he was like moving away, and I was like, it was kind of just a parting gift. But love that DVD. Yeah. Well, my my point was, um, that is, I mean, that is them at their height oh. of just professional performance. Like, hundred percent. They they literally went out on stage and lost their minds. And granted, they get they got a little Tommy Lee when he straps himself into the fucking. <laughs> drum stool and it's rotating oh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Like, Jesus, as, as a kid Halen? i got a kick out of that uh because i was like what is going on this is like yeah it was like an extreme like version of that it was funny yeah very much uh, van halen yep uh, another thing <clears throat> that people should check out after they check this episode out if you're not familiar is the roadrunner united record oh that's a good sleeper uh Dude, album. there is yeah. so many good tracks that. on that man and joey had a good a good hand in a lot that's of that right. stuff. That's a fucking great record. Damn, man. I got to revisit that because it's been a while. That's a good call. That DVD is great as well. I have. We, I could upload that for you guys if you want it. I'm sure it's on YouTube. Hell yeah. Though. Yeah. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll look for it. Yeah, I could put it on the channel and stuff like that. It'll take no time. But yeah, that's dude. Nice. People yeah. listening, go go check out that Roadrunner United stuff and the concert stuff they did was great. And Joey does a lot of stuff on there as well. So. If you like, if you like Dino from Fear Factory, he he did a lot of writing on that as well. So that's right. Just a, just an all around great record, man. But Hell yeah, we can we we can call it a day if you want. All right. So first, I want to thank Gary for coming on again so soon, so quickly. We Gary yeah. is definitely going to be on the bat phone. We're going to call him up when, uh, yeah. when we need some some <laughs> last minute guests. Uh, I want to thank all of you for tuning in, listening, watching once again. New Breed underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, New Breed podcast at gmail.com for all your questions, comments, concerns, and complaints. We do read them and we do laugh. Uh, and lastly, you can find us on r slash new metal, and you can also find us on our Facebook group. So until next time, thank you, Gary. This is Gary, Tim, and Jay saying cheers. Cheers. Thanks for having me.